welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Pilgrim's Progress, Alexander Crummel. If you hang around with mathematicians, you may have heard the phrase Erdős number. It refers to Paul Erdős, a prolific and brilliant mathematician who wrote many collaborative papers. If you publish something with Erdős, your Erdős number is 1. If you publish something with one of his collaborators, your number is 2, and so on. Then, of course, there's the Bacon number, which grew out of the game Seven Degrees of Kevin Bacon. For instance, the silent movie star Buster Keaton's Bacon number is rather incredibly a mere 2. He was in a movie version of Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn with Patty McCormick, who in turn was in the movie Frost Nixon with, yes, Kevin Bacon. If you ask us, this is more an honor for Kevin than for Buster. In any case, the reason we bring all this up is so that we can introduce the concept of a crummel number, which would measure the links between 19th century African American activists and Alexander Crummel. It turns out that pretty much all those activists have a crummel number of 1. You already know that he was a childhood friend of Henry Highland Garnett, whose life was described in a eulogy written by Crummel. The abolitionist periodical Freedom's Journal, published by John Russworm and Samuel Cornish, was launched in the Crummel household, thanks to the fact that Alexander's father, Boston Crummel, himself moved in activist circles. Later on, Alexander Crummel moved to Liberia, where he lived for about 20 years. There, he was visited by Martin Delaney, and served as commissioner alongside Edward Blyden, whom we'll discuss in an upcoming episode. Once he was back in the U.S., Crummel debated Frederick Douglass in person, and had Maria W. Stewart as one of the parishioners in his church. In the context of the American Negro Academy, which Crummel founded in 1896, he was also a mentor to a young scholar named W.E.B. Du Bois, about whom you'll be hearing much more in episodes to come. And if we bend the rules a bit, we can even go back to some 18th century figures we've discussed, as it seems like a young Crummel probably wrote a piece using the name Ignatius Sancho as a pseudonym. So who was this astoundingly well-connected man, apart from being the Kevin Bacon and Paul Erdős of 19th century Africana thought? Well, he was born free in 1819. His father had been a slave after being kidnapped as a young teenager in the region that became Sierra Leone. He was ordained as an Episcopalian priest, but fell afoul of his local bishop, who treated him with racist disdain, leading to years of conflict between the two. Then, in 1848, he traveled to England. This trip may initially have been for the sake of church fundraising, but he stayed to study at Cambridge before moving to Liberia in 1853. Here, he continued his work as a preacher, seeing his life's work as bringing Christian civilization to the native Africans, whom he frequently called pagans and heathens. Depending on his mood and audience, he could be cheerfully optimistic or deeply pessimistic about this project and about the whole experience of living in Africa. He and his wife suffered from poor health and the death of a young child, and Crummel was frustrated by his inability to inspire audiences as well as by conflict with church and government authorities. He seems not to have been an easy man to get on with, something admitted in Du Bois' moving posthumous portrait of Carmel in his famous book, The Souls of Black Folk. Du Bois spoke of his unbending righteousness, something that Crummel would probably have taken as a compliment. He once said that he was pleased to be called a little too rigid. It is in evidence that I tolerated no iniquity and that I rebuked depravity. But Du Bois portrayed him as a rather tragic figure, an isolated man who worked alone, with so little human sympathy. The ambiguity there may be intentional, Crummel received little sympathy, and he had little for others. On one notable reading of his portrait of Crummel, Du Bois critically exposes the way that, estranged and disappointed by racist treatment, Crummel turned this feeling against his own people. When his high-flown and classicizing preaching failed to inspire religious devotion, Du Bois suggested, Crummel could not help thinking, what do you expect? In another age, wrote Du Bois, he might have sat among the elders of the land in purple bordered toga, but his intellectual refinement did not make him a celebrated figure. 
similar remarks were made in his own lifetime. Frederick Douglass ruefully remarked that the homespun approach of Sojourner Truth meant she was more readily quoted than a learned man such as Crummel. The Bishop of Liberia, who sparred with Crummel almost as much as his counterpart back in New York, remarked with dry understatement that he was no popular preacher. Like Kevin Bacon's movie career then, Crummel's career as a religious leader provoked mixed reviews. He was admired for his learning, but his Cambridge education, which gave him a mastery of classical languages and his constant harping on the value of civilization, could also make him seem an elitist who was out of touch with the real needs of both Africans and African Americans. He would have vigorously rejected this charge. For one thing, that same education gave him special insight into the problems faced by the victims of slavery and colonialism. Already as a youngster while being educated at the Oneida Institute, along with Garnett, he fell under the influence of Beriah Green. Green communicated to Crummel the ideals of European Romanticism, as found in the writings of figures like Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Thomas Carlyle, and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Then, during his time in England, he came into contact with the still-living tradition of Cambridge Platonism, and learned moral philosophy from the works of figures like Joseph Butler and William Paley, works he would recommend to students in Liberia, along with those of John Locke, Francis Bacon, and other philosophical luminaries. All this gave him the basis for a metaphysical objection to racial injustice. To enslave a human is to treat an immortal, immaterial, and free soul as if it were a mere physical object to be owned. In keeping with this, Crummel thought it an eminently practical and indeed urgent undertaking to bring black people to a higher level of moral, intellectual, and above all, religious development. He said that under slavery, our natures have been dwarfed and our souls shriveled. Indeed, he agreed with David Walker, Martin Delaney, and others who believed that African Americans were unique in the level of the oppression they suffered, asserting that they were the most forlorn and degraded race of human beings on the face of the globe. Though he insisted on the potential and innate talent of black people, he despaired over their degraded and benighted condition. It seems manifest to me that, as a race in this land, we have no art, we have no science, we have no philosophy, we have no scholarship. Until we attain the role of civilization, we cannot stand up and hold our place in the world of culture and enlightenment. And when in Liberia, he had a similarly bleak assessment of the situation there. I found there great crudities and sad anomalies. How could it have been otherwise? Was not Liberia the fruit, the product of slavery? Did not its illiteracy and its immorality spring directly from the plantation? From his correspondence, we know that he often struggled with his family life, church politics, and recalcitrant parishioners in Africa, but such evidence is balanced by far sunnier passages in his writing. He assures us that he is never disappointed by the Liberians, admires the natural thriftiness and sexual restraint of the people there, as well as their talent for economic trade, and he's amazed by their beauty. Unlike the physical inferiority, at times repulsiveness, he claims to have seen among African Americans, the African natives had beautifully pure complexions, each of them an erect, finely proportioned, well-developed, symmetrical, and a noble being. In a single passage that encapsulates his own mixed reviews of the African locals, he goes within a few sentences from calling the Vey people industrious, highly intelligent, polite, and spirited, to lamenting the deep degradation of heathenism among them. But this was no contradiction. What Crummel admired in Africans, and optimistically believed was still preserved among African Americans, was immense potential for becoming truly civilized and cultivated. What did he mean by this? That's an easy question to answer, because civilization is one of his favorite themes. At one point, he simply equates civilization with schools and religion, and elsewhere he defines it in part as follows. I mean by it the clarity of the mind from the dominion of false heathen ideas. I mean by it the conscious impress of individualism and personal responsibility. As you'll notice, he closely associates moral and intellectual progress with religion, whose cultivation he sees as a primary duty of the state, alongside the maintenance of justice, the progress of education, the upholding of law and order, and national growth. 
he thus finds little or no value in indigenous African practices and beliefs. Native religions are, he says, entirely barren of true ideas about the divine, unless these are expressed in an obscure and distorted manner. Even here, though, he finds grounds for optimism, since black people in general have a strong impulse towards piety. Religious susceptibility and moral dispositions are the more marked characteristics of the Negro family and the main point in which they differ from other races. A like-minded missionary from around the same time, a native Igbo from Nigeria named Samuel Ajayi Crowther, said that when confronted with Christianity, the so-called heathens offered the defense that their gods were inferior deities commissioned by the great god to superintend inferior matters on earth. Having received the same from their forefathers, they insisted upon continuing their worship as they found it was good for them. This should ring familiar bells, since it shows these 19th century missionaries already wrestling with the coherence of diffused monotheism, which we discussed back in episode 18 of this podcast. But for Crummel, such polytheistic sentiments rang only alarm bells. Complaining of devil worship and the use of fetishes among the natives, he said simply, they have not the gospel, they are living without God. He was determined that the Africans should take on Christian principles and build their whole society upon them. In doing so, Liberia could become a beacon of truth for the rest of the world, an example for others to live up to, instead of an example of what can go wrong. As he put it, the world needs a higher type of true nationality than it now has, why should not we furnish it? In his most hopeful moments, he sees this as not merely a possibility, but a destiny, even a manifest destiny, towards which Africa is tending. In another manifestation of his debt to Romanticism, he has a fundamentally progressive understanding of history, although it is important that, for him, it is God's providence that is actively steering humankind towards a glorious future. Obviously, all this may strike the modern-day reader as more than a little problematic. Crummel was far from underestimating the devastation that Europeans had visited upon Africa. He writes of how, in order for European culture to exert influence upon Africa, a whole continent has been brought to ruin and nations on the threshold of civilization reduced to barbarism. Still, he hopes, indeed demands, that Africans should adopt the religion Europeans bring with them, and that in doing so they will be ennobled. If there is a distinctive contribution of Africans to make in the long march of history towards progress, it is not in the production of original ideas or values. It is rather the ability of black people to take on good ideas and values brought to them by others. He thus extols the flexibility of the Negro character, saying that the race is possessed of a nature more easily molded than any other class of men. His classically trained mind is irresistibly brought to compare black people to the ancient Greeks and Romans, who, he claims, also took over the best ideas of the cultures they contacted. Like them, the Negro, with a mobile and plastic nature, with a strong receptive faculty, seizes upon and makes over to himself by imitation the better qualities of others. This is in contrast to an alternative attitude articulated by Martin Delaney, who once pointedly asked, the English, French, Irish, German, Italian, Turk, Persian, Greek, Jew, and all other races have their native or inherent peculiarities, and why not our race? Later thinkers would develop this idea of black uniqueness as something to be preserved, including thinkers like Anna Julia Cooper and Du Bois, both of whom looked up to Crummel in many ways. For Crummel, however, being unique held no value. What mattered was recognizing, receiving, and embodying the best that humanity had to offer. The ability of Africans to play a cultural imitation game was shown by the speed with which the English language spread in Liberia. The significance of English to Liberia is a topic to which Crummel devoted a whole essay. Taking stock of the language's progress, he marveled at the fact that natives who still went about naked were literate, and spoke of a man who was a leader in devil dances and yet can read and write like a scholar. Facility with English was more than useful in his eyes. Speaking it was a crucial step towards enlightenment, because Crummel saw English as quite simply far superior to native African tongues. He quotes with approval another writer who calls these languages harsh, abrupt, energetic, indistinct in enunciation, meager in point of words, with little grammar and difficult to learn. 
For good measure, Crummel adds that they are characterized by lowness of ideas, the speech of rude barbarians, lacking those ideas of virtue of moral truth, and those distinctions of right and wrong with which we, all our life long, have been familiar. Again, Crummel is not totally unaware of the appalling implications of what he's saying here. He concedes that language is spread from one culture to another through conquest, and that English in particular is indicative of sorrowful history. But he sees this as fitting with his overall point, since he assumes that African languages as he encounters them are only dregs of original, more noble ones that have been ruined through societal collapse. Now, it would be easy to get the wrong idea here, and to suppose that Crummel has the rather implausible theory that some languages are, in their very grammatical structure, morally superior to others. That would go pretty well with his acceptance of the widespread but false theory that some languages have less grammar than others. By the way, if they are grammatically so rudimentary, why are they harder to learn? But in fact, his view would seem to be a more plausible one, namely that languages preserve within them the history and values of the people who speak them. Thus, English is full of expressions that have to do with morality and liberty, which he takes to be deeply ingrained in British culture. It is, he says at one point, the language of freedom. Even slaves in the American South have imbibed the value of freedom as they matured, simply by growing up as native speakers. No less important for Crummel is, of course, its intimate connection with Protestant Christianity. He speaks of the importance of the English Bible and says that there is a kind of identity between this language and religion itself. So here, Crummel signals his agreement with other 19th century theorists of language, who were convinced that language shapes thought. One could even say that, despite his disdain for native African tongues, he's not that far from the approach of the ethno-philosophers we discussed earlier in this podcast series, with their attempt to extract philosophical commitments from the very vocabulary and syntax of African languages. To better understand Crummel's ideas about race, we could turn to another essay published in 1889 called The Race Problem in America. Crummel begins by seeking in the past for what he calls laws of population to predict what may come of America's problems of racial conflict and domination. But he argues that the past, from the relations of peoples in ancient Mesopotamia to the encounter between Europeans and indigenous peoples in the Americas, offers not one clear pattern, but rather a range of possible outcomes. The races may mingle together, and the difference between them will disappear. There may be conflict, resulting in the expulsion or eradication of one of the races, or they may remain in the same place and achieve peace while nevertheless remaining separate. The first option of mingling together he rejects as a possibility for the black and white races in the United States, which may remind us of Martin Delaney's perplexing claim that pure races can never be eliminated through interbreeding. Crummel's argument is scientifically less ridiculous, though. He claims that intermixing has almost always been the result of white men raping black women, and that the free black population will never willingly undergo amalgamation with the majority race. Still, he is, as much as Delaney, committed to the notion that differences between races are of divine origin. He defines a race as a compact homogeneous population of one blood, ancestry, and lineage. And as this suggests, he thinks that races can be compared to families and even identified as large families. They have every right to hold on to their unique identity, just as smaller families perpetuate themselves. Since America is going to continue to have the two separate races, then, the problem becomes the distinctively moral one of how they will live together in amity. To his mind, there can be only one answer, the complete and entire civil and political equality of all the peoples of this land. The fulfillment of this goal through the democratic participation of all, instead of the oligarchic domination of one race over the other, will demonstrate God's hand in history. Here we can see Crummel, now late in his career, transposing ideas he developed in his years in Liberia for use in an American context. His faith in moral and religious progress manifests as the expectation that African Americans will form an increasingly enlightened group of citizens within the wider culture. Crummel's theological understanding of history remains broadly the same, but his political objective is now very different. No longer an independent nation of native and emigre Africans on African soil, 
but a nation within a nation that is the United States. Because he remains a fundamentally future-oriented thinker, he encourages the now emancipated African Americans to stop lamenting the wrongs of slavery, to look ahead and not back. It was this that brought him into conflict with Frederick Douglass in a debate at Harper's Ferry in 1885. Douglass thought it was important to keep reflecting on the history of slavery, so as to understand and remedy its lingering effects in order to achieve the ultimate goal of integrating into white society. By contrast, Crummel's advice was, in effect, let's get over the sufferings of the past and strive towards a better tomorrow. Modern-day scholar Wilson Moses phrases the dispute nicely in his intellectual biography of Crummel, Douglas's program was for black people to remember slavery and to forget that they were black. Crummel's was for them to remember that they were black and forget slavery. Douglas was also impatient with Crummel's rather disdainful attitude towards uneducated African Americans. But whether Crummel really deserves his reputation for elitist snobbery is questionable. Both in Liberia and in the United States, he emphasized that it would be foolish to promote advanced learning at the cost of practical skills which might lead to commercial prosperity. It would be pointless to teach the heathens of Africa to read Latin and Greek and leave them too delicate for manual labor. And we should remember that the great European scholars were always men of action, as well as men of letters. As he elsewhere remarks, a people may have learning and yet be poor, degraded, and vicious. So, the focus should not be on, for instance, getting universities to admit more black students, but on vocational skills and, of course, the moral character Crummel likes to call manhood. But, of course, Crummel was the last person to disdain higher learning, having benefited from it himself. He thought that his much-vaunted civilization would be instilled in the black population above all by scholars and thinkers. One of the more vituperative passages in his writings, though there's plenty of competition for that title, attacks an author who dared to suggest that the kind of education the Negro should receive should not be very refined nor classical, but adapted to his present condition. Crummel's response, as though there is to be no future for the Negro. As for the much smaller matter of the future of this podcast, we'll be returning soon enough to this question about the relative value of vocational training and intellectual disciplines when we discuss the contrasting approaches of Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, whose famous phrase, talented tenth, would most definitely have applied to Alexander Crummel. But in the shorter run, we'll be situating Crummel in his context in a more nuanced and complete way by turning to someone we only just mentioned, Wilson Moses. He's a leading expert on Crummel and on the history of black nationalism, so it makes plenty of sense to ask him how Crummel fits into that history. And maybe we'll also ask Professor Moses how close he's come to being in a movie with Kevin Bacon, next time here on the History of Africana Philosophy. I'm gonna tell God